Can you um, chat something? Oh, okay, great, Nushan, thank you. Just to make sure you're hearing us okay. If you can't hear or see or have any of those things, go ahead and throw them in the chat for us. Sounds good. Sounds like it's working. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for being here. It's, um, yeah, it's fun to, fun to do this. And we're really excited that you guys can all make it. We've had a little bit of a um, fire drill morning with technology, but we're all here and um, yeah, ready to go. <laughs> so, um, so I'll just kind of kick us off and I, I, I'm going to let everyone sort of introduce themselves as we go because we have a, a bit of a format where each of the five of us will be sharing a little bit um, individually. So if you, if you only know one or two or none of us, you'll, you'll get to know us all pretty soon. Um, but we, uh, we are five colleagues and friends who um, come to our work. We all have very different work, but it's all very similar. So we come to the work that each of us does from a shared understanding of how humans work, why we do the things we do, what's behind um, thriving when we're thriving in different areas of life, what's going on, what makes that possible, what's behind that. When we aren't thriving and we feel stuck and we hate life, what's behind that and what's going on. So that basic shared understanding is underpins everything that we all do. And on the surface, it's kind of unique. On the surface, we all are, you know, what we do and who we help and how we do it looks kind of different. So um, Angus and Rohini love to work with relationships. Scott um, likes to do things in health and vitality and helps people in those areas. Barb is all about work and business and, and works with entrepreneurs and business leaders. And I like to help people with habits and anxiety. So if you look at it on the surface, it looks very different. But again, what's beneath it all is the same thing. And so um, we thought this would be a really cool opportunity to come together and kind of get into the weeds of, of these different areas of life, because these are things obviously we all have, we're all in relationships, we all have health. Hopefully you don't have too many habits or anxiety, but you've probably had them at some point. So, you know, it's, it's all sort of these different areas of life different, but again, because the underpinning is the exact same, because it's coming from this, this one understanding, what tends to happen is that we'll be sitting back listening to, um, you know, something about relationships, and you'll have an insight about your health or like we see this all the time in our work. People come for business help or help getting over a habit and their relationship gets better or their health, you know, something else gets better. Um, so it's really cool to, to see that. So um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's kind of the, the basis of it. And what we'll do just format wise is um, go around and, and each of us is going to share a little bit, again, just on the different topics that we're really passionate about. Um, and then we would love to take questions and open it up for quite a bit of conversation. So we won't take too long as we share. Um, and if you do have questions, I think the Q&A box is, tends to be better than the chat for those. And they are private. I mean, you can put your name, you can be anonymous or not. Um, but I think as we're, as we're speaking, go ahead and put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. And then um, once we've all shared a little bit, we'll be able to address those. So anything, anything I missed, guys, or anything you want to add? That sounds great, Amy. Thank you. I'm just finding the Q&A box right now, so I found it. <laughs> yeah, it should be kind of like bottom middle, I think. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Well, welcome. Thank you, Amy, for setting this up. And it's so great. Thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat. I see we have people from South Africa, Washington, Denmark, fantastic Canada. So it's great to spend time with all of you today. And, um, you know, Angus and I really, um, as Amy said, we really love working with people um, in relationships, helping them to have uh, an easier time, a more graceful time. And part of the reason we love that is because we really struggled and are so grateful to have come out the other side of that and to really be able to enjoy our relationship in a way that we've never really been able to um, before this understanding, even with all of the counseling, workshops, various things that we tried, it didn't really um, help us to get more ease 
in our connection and more, um, you know, more open hearted. It seemed like there was just a lot of hard work happening. And so it's really fun to be able to see that it doesn't take very much to have a significant shift in how we relate to each other. And it's really exciting to see other people feeling those benefits as well. And so I'll just share very briefly the, the biggest shift that happened for me, which I hadn't seen before this understanding was that Angus really could not be responsible for how I was feeling. And I knew that intellectually before, but I didn't have an experiential knowing of that. And so what that meant was that I would, um, you know, it just looked to me like his mood was impacting how I felt or his behavior was impacting how I felt. And it wasn't until I got a better understanding of the role of thought and creating my experience and really seeing that I don't feel him directly. I feel my thinking. And that as a result of that, what happened is I started to see what was invisible to me previously, which was all of this judgmental thoughts that were present. And as I started to see it as thought and not as him, I would take his behavior less personally and I would also take my own thinking less seriously. And that was really what made the huge shift. So when I started to take my thinking less seriously, what that did was it opened up um, my experience to feel more of my innate okayness more of the, that, that experience of knowing that I'm okay no matter what. And what that did for me was it allowed me to relax and it, it had me stop trying to fix and change Angus because I was thinking that he needed to be different so that I could have a nicer life. And it also stopped me trying to fix and change myself because what I saw is that we could have a great relationship with our personalities, with our humanness, the warts and all aspects of life didn't need to get in the way of us being able to really um, deepen in our love, deepen in our connection. And that was just such a game changer. Yes, it was. <laughs> so do I, did you introduce me? You didn't, no, I didn't uh, introduce, introduce you, yourself. sorry. So my name's Angus and uh, I am married to this lovely lady on my left. You're right, I guess. Um, and I, you know, we're relationship coaches and I, and I, sometimes laugh about, you know, you know, what are our credentials as relationship coaches? And I think that really, the ones that really stand out the most are the fact that, you know, we went through a very long period where our marriage was just super conflictual. And, um, and I think the fact that we were able to get through that, through being exposed to this understanding, I feel that anybody can heal their marriage based on what we went through alone. So for me, I think that the, the thing that really stood out as far as I was concerned with how things really shifted in a very positive direction was, uh, you know, and I've joked about this in the past, is that our marriage was in such, such a state in tatters, if you like. And uh, quite often um, we would get into a very difficult situation and I would find myself ending up going to some sort of um, personal growth workshop either as a consequence of my behavior or it was the only way that we could see maybe this was going to be the last opportunity to really heal things. And nothing, nothing ever really worked, but um, you know, we, we hung on in there by hook or by crook. But the real shift happened after literally about probably 15 years of un unadulterated suffering in many respects. Uh, when Rahini got exposed to this understanding and um, what really became very obvious to me was that my behavior, which probably hadn't changed at all, I was my typical obnoxious self. In the face of that, Rahini would, would, it would be like water off a duck's back. She was suddenly not reacting to it. What is more, not only was she not reacting to it, but she was actually, I could sort of register this sort of expression of compassion on her face as if I was suffering. And when I asked her, you know, to articulate what was going on, that was the essence of it. She basically would say things along the lines that, you know what, I see that you're suffering, I see that you're suffering with your thinking. And at the time, that might have been some sort of new psycho babble, some sort of new lingo that she picked up. Um, but what was really, for me, so different was that the, the expression of, on her face, the, the look in her eyes was one of authentic um, compassion. And that really, that really stood out to me and, and, and it piqued my interest. And from that point forward, I decided, yeah, I need to know more about 
what she's learned and I need to know more about this understanding. And that's when I sort of began my quest to sort of do a, do a mentorship program with the Pranskys. And really ever since that point moving forward, it's been a case of me getting more acquainted with this idea that I feel my thinking and I don't feel my external circumstances. And that really is, the, really I feel is, is the essence of what we do as relationship coaches. We really point our clients in that direction. And it seems like it's a very simple idea, something that's very, maybe fairly easy to disseminate, but people really struggle with that. You know, I feel like even last night I was speaking to someone and, um, and I pointed this out to them, you know, because they were suffering in their relationship. And he said, yeah, you've been telling me that since day one and we've been doing this for weeks. And I said, yeah, you know, we're kind of, I'm kind of a one trick pony, but you have to get this. And when you do, everything will just, you'll, you'll just find everything will start slowing into place and things will start feeling so much better. And I was really pleasantly surprised because I feel like you really got something last night. But that's kind of, you know, that's the essence of what we do. And I don't want to take up too much time. Time is short. But I really look forward to this, uh, this seminar. And I can't wait to see you real time or in person. And with that, I pass the baton on to my good friend, Scott Kelly. Thank you very much. It's always, always, always a pleasure to listen to you guys. I feel like uh, my relationship always gets better when I just hear what you guys are talking about. So my name is Scott Kelly, and, uh, and I am, I've been a health practitioner for, for many, many years. And, um, and when I came across this understanding, I had a really profound shift, not only in myself, but in what I began to see as possible for the, the people that I was working with. So I'll give you a little bit of background as far as what I was doing in my work. So much of it was in and around uh, helping people with orthopedic challenges, back pain, knee pain, uh, shoulder pain challenges, um, digestive challenges, uh, mood challenges. And what I found before this understanding is I would get really, really caught up in people's experience. I'd get really, really caught up in what they were experiencing, their symptoms, how they were experiencing it. And I wanted to help people uh, get rid of their, their problem, get rid of their pain, get rid of the, the challenge that they were experiencing, which was what I thought I was hired for. But what I started to see when I came across this understanding was that there was something so much deeper behind the symptoms that could actually give us a much greater awareness of possibility for our health and well-being that is far greater than just eliminating symptoms, but opening us up to possibility in the freedom of our body, the freedom of expression in the world, the freedom of movement, the freedom of being able to play freely, the freedom to connect more deeply in our relationships. And I wanna share a little bit about kind of how I saw this. And that is that I started to see that the body is literally like a symphony. Moment to moment, there is a symphony going on at the cellular level with all of our cells, with all of the bacteria, in our body, with all of the systems, with all of the organs. It, there is a giant symphony going on. And the great conductor of the symphony was vitality. Vitality is our innate, energetic, formless uh, life force behind everything. And it is the great conductor. But unfortunately, when we get out of sync with our vitality, when we get out of sync, we start to hear more noise in the system than we do harmony. And we start to pay more attention to the noise than the fact that there's an amazing source of vitality behind it all that can help self-correct along the way. And as I started to see the impact of this understanding and how it aligns in the body so that it can actually repair, rejuvenate, and, uh, and, and re-enliven, I started to realize that there was far less for me to do as a coach and a therapist and, uh, and someone focused on physical therapy. 
And there was far more to do in helping people see that there was an innate capacity to heal designed in every single cell of the body. And once I started to get onto that and help to point people in that direction, I saw that, that health shifted for them in profound ways. And that not only as, as uh, Rahini and Angus and Amy have shared, that not only did their health change, but everything in life begins to shift when we begin to see that there is a vitality, that there is a formless energy, that there is a helping hand behind everything that goes on in our, our human experience. And so I started to see this one last point, and, I, and, I, and it was so profound for me, and that is that cells are dying moment to moment in our body. And cells are being born moment to moment in our body. And the, the, the possibility of those cells that are being born is really determined by the consciousness of the whole system. And the more we understand the deeper understanding behind our human experience, the more possibility those cells that are being born have to express themselves in extraordinary ways through the ordinary way of cells. It seems kind of crazy, but there's so much possibility behind life and movement and expression and creativity and resilience. And all we have to do is get out of the way more often. And that's what I love to share so much when it comes to health and well being and vitality is that we don't have to work hard, we just have to listen deeper. So, with that, what I'd love to do is pass it on to the lovely Barbara Patterson. Barb? <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Hi, everybody. Really nice to be with you. And, you know, it just as I listen to Angus Marhini and Scott and Amy kicking us off, you know, one of the inspirations of all of us kind of coming together was I think all of us in our lives as we start to look at this understanding which is again you know where is our experience coming from and another way I like to look at it who's the truth of you know what's the truth of who we really are that we also have this deeper innate nature and if we see that, if we understand where experience is coming from, that we're living life inside out, right? We're experiencing life inside out, and we have this amazing potential capability. It's so interesting to see how when people begin to explore that for themselves, things shift, relationships change, work, vitality, health, habits, all of that. And so we got excited because each of us in our own journey has the holdouts, the places that look like there are exceptions to that, you know? No, 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 that works. That's helpful here, but not, not here. And um, I happen to be out east right now. I'm working with a client in a three-day off-site. And uh, it's one of my favorite clients, and we've been working together for about four years. And one of the things that's really interesting is today, we're really looking at um, kind of how they can run efficiently. Like, what, what are some things that they can be doing to, um, they're growing really fast, they're um, making a big difference with their clients and in the community, they have a lot going on. And it's interesting to even say that even in our work, whether that's what I'm doing in this moment or whether it's what a vision we have for our organization, for our own business, for our own lives, how does this understanding help that too? And it's interesting because I think it really comes back to this idea of when we see where, where the real source of health is, where the real source of a healthy culture is, you know, internally or in an organization. For me, my own personal journey has been about effort versus um, allowing things to move through, me, you know, like this relationship of it really look like in work in particular, uh, you know, effort, striving, push, drive, um, you know, managing myself, managing everything, keeping it all in my head, that that was the source of why I really did well. And when I came across this understanding, it was the first time that that was really put into question. Every kind of other modality I did 
um, seemed to give me more tools to manage myself, seemed to help give me more helpful things to try and get my head right, to try and get my behavior right, to try and get my psychology right. And yet it was so amazing to me that when I came across this, it was about a letting go of all those ideas and getting on a personal um, journey around, no, no, what if, what if there's something else available to us that's been really invisible to me or I've my relationship to it was very different. And so I think in our desire to do this free webinar today, and we're going to open it up to questions and to share, and then ultimately we're doing a workshop in LA together in July. The reason for this was, yeah, you know, often in ourselves or when we work with people or teams, there seems to be a place where it's like, no, is that true here too? Does it really, you know, how does knowing the truth of who I am help me when I'm communicating with an employee that, you know, isn't doing well? How does it help me when I'm trying something new in my business and I'm feeling insecure? You know, so it's, it does. Yeah, it does. And why is that? And I think the reason that it is, is because it, in a way, you, you begin to let go of a lot of ideas and a lot of thought and a lot of clutter about life and yourself and other people. You start to have a nuance of awareness around your own reactivity. You start to find your more centered, neutral, just to use that language, more common sense. You start to tap into kind of this deeper nature, a different quality of thinking. And you start to see that, that has a, that's playing a role and it has a real benefit. And so that guides us, whether we're up to trying something brand new that we've never done, whether we're being challenged by life and relationships or a health issue. You know, you start to see that the more we have that personal knowing, like our own experience of that, that it comes forward and helps us out no matter what we're up to. So we're really looking forward to um, exploring that more and opening it up in a few minutes to everybody else. But I just finally want to say that, um, you know, kind of our work in the world and the reason I just love that conversation is, you know, I've always been curious about kind of the contribution that we can be. And for myself, I used to think I had this special purpose, but I didn't know what it was. And so it was a big problem, <laughs> you know? And it looked like if I figured that out, my whole world would be resolved. Um, and so it's been really profound and amazing and freeing and um, opened up a ton of new possibilities when I've let go of all of those mental constructs, all of those ideas. And I just started to get more curious and listen from a different place. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Amy. It's so interesting. I kind of feel like you guys said everything, but you know, it's because, <laughs> because we really are coming from the same place, but pointing to sort of different places, you know, and so much of what all of you said, um, uh, you know, you could just see it in every area of life, every single area of life. So around habits, um, I think, you know, if you look around out in the world, the way that pretty much everyone is trying to, is viewing a habit and then trying to fix a habit or end a habit is by seeing it as a big old problem this is a problem, this shouldn't be happening, there's something wrong with me, this needs to stop, and then just attacking the problem. Now, that has a certain logic to it. <laughs> I did it for 30 some years myself, but you know, it makes sense on some level. This is a, and, and our habits do create things that are problematic in our life, right? I mean, they hurt our health and our finances and our relationships and our work, so all of that. So it's not that they aren't problematic, but there's something so kind of nuanced, but also so gigantic in, in seeing, oh my gosh, we've all been sort of looking at these things that we do in life, these things we fall into, we procrastinate, or we drink or smoke or eat too much, or we get angry and lose our temper, or we're on the internet too much, or whatever it might be. 
and we just focus there so innocently because it's the thing that's present and visible in our lives and that everyone is telling us don't do that anymore. So we just are so camped out there calling it a problem, calling us a problem for having this problem that that we're like in the quicksand, running faster in the quicksand, trying to find the right fix. You know, trying to get the symphony to all be perfect, like Scott said, or like trying to find the right tool, like Barb said, you know, it's like, and, and ironically, what that does is make everything worse <laughs> because now we're in it and now we have layered on top of this, these urges or this, this desire to escape or whatever's kind of, whatever the habit's about to begin with, we've layered innocently layered on top and I'm wrong for it and I need to fix it and this better stop. So what I love about looking at habits from this bigger understanding it is it completely flips that on its head. And again, this, is, this might sound, sound kind of outrageous, but just like, what if it with me? What if our habits aren't a problem at all? What if uncomfortable feelings aren't a problem at all? What if you aren't a problem at all? There's no, there's no flaw. There's no issue with you. There's absolutely nothing to fix. There's just some stuff to understand. There's just some stuff to kind of see in a new way. And, you know, to really flip it and say, wow, everything that shows up is totally okay, totally safe, totally meant to be here, maybe even totally for my good. So I see habits as this amazing, now I didn't always, and I don't always right now in my life necessarily, but in the bigger picture, the wiser me sees habits at all that little bit of stuckness and suffering and, and conditioned stuff that we just know that we're bigger than, you know, we know we shouldn't be doing that is this beautiful, elegant, like alarm system, this design that's like, Hey, you're doing that again. Maybe you want to take a minute. <laughs> maybe you want to not believe your conditioned thinking so much. Like maybe, maybe you're just a little caught up or you're not seeing clearly or your head is running the show again. You're back in your head. And if we can just start to flip things, I mean, it's, a, it's really, again, like the complete opposite of what we're used to because usually that urge or that feeling, that discomfort would arise and we get angry at it. We get afraid of it. We jump into action to bat it away and that always makes it bigger. So what if we just saw something about how we work so that we don't have to do that to ourselves anymore so that we have this stuff arise and we somehow deeply intuitively know, oh, like that might be my brain. That might be my body doing that same old thing. It's the machinery. The machinery is doing what the machinery does, but I'm not the machinery. And that's, that's part of what I think uh, this understanding does for us to, in every area that we've talked about, in every area of life, is, is by helping us see, you know, like Barb said, the truth of who we are. We aren't the machinery. We aren't a thought. We aren't a feeling. We aren't a behavior. We aren't the past because there isn't one. We aren't the future because there isn't one. Like, what are we? What is the truth of who we are? And, and as our mind settles down and we look in that direction, we sense like what's there beyond it. And it's full of health and vitality and wisdom and clarity. And you don't have habits and issues there. You feel stuff, stuff arises and moves through that space and we experience it, but we, but it isn't a problem and there's nothing to fix and there's nothing to do. So, so we end up just open and expansive and, and human, not hiding from our humanness and trying to fix it, but fully human and it's crazy because when that happens, like we're just, you know, let's do this, like we're just big, like stuff just moves through us and we don't get so tangled up and caught up in it. And, you know, months or years later, we're still doing that thing. It just, it, it reverses that in a lot of ways. So yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing if you think about it, like, you know, what, what can come of that? And that's what all of us, I love just hearing that and what we're all sharing. It's, it's the basis of all of it. It's like, there's not a problem. We aren't what we think. We aren't what we think we are. You know, there's a whole different place to look and so many areas of life just begin to shift and open up when we look there. Yeah, thanks Amy. 
So we want to open it up and um, as Amy said at the beginning of the call, probably the best way to do this with a Zoom webinar is to go to the uh, Q&A button, which should be in the middle of your screen, bottom middle of your screen. So you can type in questions there. Um, and, and really, we know in an hour, we just wanted to begin to create a space for an invitation for people. You know, like uh, I like Amy's what if it, you know, and uh, looking in that direction. And what if uh, there's a possibility that you have this capability, you have what you need to handle whatever life is throwing your way. So I see we have a couple questions coming in. I don't know if any of you guys have had a chance to kind of sort through them, but I see for the Rosses, there's a question about what if one couple is um, seeing this and not everybody? And the other question is really around, how do you know if it's time to leave a marriage? How do you trust what that knowing or not knowing? And we can uh, start there. I think um, in terms of the, when one person uh, sees it, has the understanding and the other person does, I mean, that really was what it was like for Angus and I. I was interested in the understanding and was really impacted by it. And because of all of the personal growth things that I dragged Angus to do initially, he like he didn't want to know anything about it. But the shift that I felt in myself was what was most important. And the ripple effect is what happened in the relationship. So all of a sudden, I was more connected with my own well-being. I was feeling lighter, enjoying life more. I was not taking Angus's behavior personally. And you know, he didn't, he didn't like he said, he didn't know what had happened to me. And so that made the difference in our relationship. So from my perspective, it doesn't require both people to see this, but each of you will be impacted by it in various ways, just because of the, the side effects of what happens when one person is more connected with their true nature and more um, resilient as a result of that. Um, and then in terms of the other question about knowing um, if it's the right time to leave a marriage, um, you know, obviously you have to listen to your own inner knowing. But what I can say is because I spent many, um, many years being married to Angus with one foot out the door and it wouldn't take very much for me to be um, ready to pull that hair trigger and think I just can't be with him. This is never going to work. And um, so what I would say is if, if if I was thinking about how to know if that was the right decision at this point in time, I would know that it would be coming from a place of love inside of myself. And one of the, the things in your question that you mentioned is that um, it's a lot of work to manage your thinking around your husband. And, um, and I would agree that would be a lot of work. And that's, that's kind of a signal to let you know that that's not really um, allowing yourself to connect um, with, with, with what you know inside, managing thinking is very different than um, just seeing thought for what it is. And I, I absolutely understand. I thought with this understanding initially that, oh, well, if I feel better, if I have nicer thoughts, and I'm just going to manage my thinking so that I have nicer feelings all the time. I can do that. Of course, it didn't work. And it's exhausting. And so what did make such a huge difference was just seeing thought for what it is. And in the seeing it for what it is, it, um, it really freed me up from identifying with it. And as it freed me up from identifying with it, these deeper feelings, it was so much easier to connect with the deeper feelings within myself. And, and for me, and I'm not saying this would happen for everybody, but for me, that is what allowed me to connect with the love that was already there, the love that initially brought us together and, um, and just help me to, to, to see all the possibility that I wasn't able to see previously. Can I, can I just quickly address that first point, that first question, because I feel like that for me was a situation where you were very much um, exposed to this understanding first, and really I had no idea where you were in your mind or what you'd been up to. But I think what happened was that I was completely um, out of touch with how stirred I was, how stirred up I was, and I was probably going through a depression at the time. And um, so when you showed up, showed up at the table with this understanding and were coming from a place of compassion, and that was very visible to me, 
then it really, in a sense, it felt like you were holding a mirror up to my, my behavior at the time. And I got to see my own behavior for what it was, which was someone who was very anxious and, and, and very out of whack. So it really helped me look in a different direction and, and show me really where I was in my mind. So that was really helpful. And I think it is, you know, you can have one person exposed to this understanding and then there'd be this opportunity for the other party to really get a sense of, you know, where they are in their own self. And that's really, that's really about how it showed up for me. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, Scott, uh, you've gotten a couple questions. Yeah. One, I don't know if you've had a chance to read them, if you want to kind of address those. And um, not everyone can see the questions, so. Sure. So Cassandra's asking if um, if a quiet mind, let's go back, I just, uh, if a quiet mind or peace of mind gives our new cells a chance to express themselves differently uh, when we are not in our thinking. You know, the, the, the way that, the way that I see this, and I think we can all see this, if we just kind of reflect on uh, what our body feels like when we have less on our mind. The way that I oftentimes express it is that when our mind gets quiet, our physiology gets quiet. And when our physiology gets quiet, we, we hold less tension in the body. And when there's less tension in the body, we have an opportunity to allow things to move through more freely whether those are toxins, whether those are thoughts, uh, whether they are experiences, whatever they are, we have the experience or the, the, the potential to allow things to move through more freely. And things don't get so caught up. When we hold tension in the system, innocently hold tension in the system, uh, things begin to accumulate in the body. And they create and they generate inflammation throughout the system. And as Amy was saying, that's, that's this brilliant, amazing alarm system letting us know that something, something is off. But unfortunately, we don't look to this deeper level of understanding as something that's, that's potentially available to us. We oftentimes look to the symptom and then get afraid of the symptom and start to address the symptom and now we're tangled up in the weeds of the symptom. And by pulling the lens back and understanding that there is a deeper capacity within us that's available to us moment to moment, we can more uh, readily allow ourselves to be available to that through this understanding. Um, let's see, there's another question. Um, and you can come back around. Uh, Chris was asking, and I may have missed, I'll go back and look, but Chris was asking, uh, do you give protocols and tell people what to follow or do you help them listen to uh, their own body? Well, the most powerful asset that we all have is our own innate wisdom. And as soon as we direct our attention outside of ourselves, we literally begin to distrust our deeper wisdom and we break rapport with that deeper part of us that has a deeper knowing about what would be most helpful for us, whether that's who to see as a health practitioner, what to put in our body, how to move, when to put ourselves to bed. There are so many ways in which our deeper wisdom can assist. And so what I have found to be most helpful is helping people tune back into their greatest resource so that they can always rely on their deeper wisdom moment to moment, no matter where they are in the world, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they are, they have this deeper wisdom that travels with them moment to moment. And so protocols may have a, a small role, but ultimately the idea is to point to the deeper wisdom that each of us has within. That's great, thanks Scott. Amy, you've had a few questions you wanted to take a look at those yeah i'm gonna um i'm gonna speak to uh ron's question so he says um i see where anxiety comes from and it goes away automatically this doesn't work with my habit somehow i'm not seeing something deeply enough about my habit and i seem to be blind and need a new insight to respond automatically to blow off my habit the first thing i 
and that just comes to mind is like um, we're always just seeing what we see and something goes first and something goes second and something goes 50th. So like me too, you know, like I saw through anxiety and I didn't have panic attacks anymore, but then I started binge eating. Well, you know, it, it, it's like we, we see something and then sometimes we don't, but, but we have that, that you have that feedback, you have that the habit is showing you, okay, there's something I'm not seeing, which is great. Um, you know, so, so that's not a problem. <laughs> like that's totally normal that you see this and not that. That's just how it is sometimes. But the one thing I kind of want to have you do in that is, is try to not thingify anxiety and a habit and separate them and see them as two separate things because they're the same thing, the exact same thing. They're, they're both a feeling that shows up in you that isn't you, that's totally fine, that's gonna, that's safe and, gonna, and moving through you in motion. And we always just do what occurs to us to do from a feeling that feels really real. So when it shows up in your mind says, oh, this is anxiety, I know that that's safe, I can relax and let that go, then that's easy for you right now. When, it, when a feeling, it's the same thing, it's just a feeling, it's energy. Even a feeling is putting too much on it, it's energy, it's motion, moving up, moving through you. And your mind jumps in, that computer, that's not you, and you don't wanna trust it all the time, but that computer jumps in and says, oh, this is trying to get me to do my habit, ah, then everything's tight, and it, you're no longer open, and it looks serious, and you fall into it. So see if you can just see it. It's, it's the exact same stuff. Habits aren't different. Even anxiety, depression, any other problem, on one level, the really important level to look at, it's all the same. And especially given that you've had success with anxiety, like see if that helps open up the habit piece of it. Go ahead, Rainey, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to um, say um, for you, Barb, to, I see a couple yeah. of questions coming your way. Yeah, I think um, the, one of the questions is, you know, when you're working with other people in business, do you, is it, um, do they accept what you're saying? Do they take on, does it take longer? And the reason I want to answer that is because I think it really applies no matter who you're talking to, you know, people will ask that about their mate, they'll ask that about their sister or brother or kid, <laughs> you know, like how to share this. And um, are there any situations where people resist hearing things? And, and I think the one thing I wanna say is when I began to see for myself the both the kind of amazing profound implications of this understanding which fall into the category of wow I'm not a fixed personality oh my gosh I I'm not who I think I am there's something else there beyond thought and oh I I actually do well in the unknown oh I'm more creative like there's there's this infinite well of being inside of us, you know, like when I started to explore and get curious about those things, I, it was shifting and changing the kind of quality of my own feeling inside. It was opening up to new possibilities about myself. And then the other thing that we've talked about is as I started to re relate to thought differently, just in general, very simply, not taking all my thinking so seriously, not respecting it, because for me, everything I thought, well, that's impossible, but most everything I thought got my attention and respect. And I, you know, I thought that was the way you worked life out. That was the way you made sense. That's how you made decisions. And, uh, and so when I started to look at that, I started to see practical and profound implications. Practical things were like, oh, I could say yes to something I've never done before because I knew my mind would give me ideas, right? That that was a part of the design in a really practical way, it would help me out. So I got more comfortable being in situations where that were unpredictable, that I didn't have it all figured out. Other practical implications were I was, um, you know, not as reactive as I used to be. Now, maybe my reactivity wasn't really uh big and extreme but i was reactive inside 
I was mulling things over after the fact. I would think about things a lot or I'd pre-plan a lot. Well, one of the practical implications of this understanding was that I stopped doing that. I saw there was no juice there. I saw that it was me living in my head. I saw there was a difference between Barb living life through all of her thinking and just kind of being in life. And the, I'm using those as examples because it was really important that I discovered my own understanding of this, like that it came through in a way that was meaningful to me, that it was relevant to my life. And the more I got student of this, right? I became, because I, I just want to say when I first started learning this, I got really impacted and I knew I wanted to use it in my work, but I kind of kept my learning at a shallow level because I was listening through intellect for a very long time. I was kind of listening from a place of how I was going to teach it. I was listening through the lens of how it would help everybody else, you know, family, clients. You know, I was kind of, I wasn't really just taking it in, letting it wash over me and having my own journey with it. And so at one point I kind of fired myself and said, you don't, you know, you do this for, for you and not for any other reason. And as soon as I did that, now, once I saw it, that became, it made talking to other people much easier, talking to business people, talking to people that have been diagnosed with, you know, something, talking to friends, family, all of that became easier, not because I got it or I figured out a way to say it, you know, that was palatable. It all got easier because I absolutely saw it for myself. And then I just knew I had to show up and listen, whether it's a business or a friend or a client, listen. And then I know that in my presence and my listening, things will occur to me. I'll hear where the understanding will help them in their situation. So, thanks. Thanks, Barb. Angus, do you want to take um, this, this question? Sure. So there's a question here. I would really like to marry my mate after being six years together, but he feels not like we or slash he need it, saying he loves me and does not need to be married in order to have a great life together. How can I deal with this? I love a romantic celebration and commitment. Is it my thinking only that I feel impatient? This issue keeps coming up, even though I know it's my thinking. Well, I guess for me, what comes forward around that is that um, the most important way to have a conversation around this particular issue, and any issue in a sense that feels like it's maybe complicated or, or, or um, I, you just moved the question for me. I need to oh, kind of, my wife's interfering with this whole process and, and making it more difficult for me. I need to see the question. Okay. So um, it's the most important thing is to, is to maintain a position of neutrality because in that state, your mind will at least be able to be open up to creative you know, opportunities. And, it, and it's the same for him. So I, I think there's a danger uh, in having a conversation when you're feeling stirred up. And obviously it's something that's important to you but I think the most important probably approach around this issue would be just to sort of try and be conscious of maintaining a state of neutrality and have those conversations when you feel like you both have a settled mind. Because the danger would be to get stirred up, get a little bit wrapped around the axle because, you know, this is something, these are standards and expectations that you have and need to be met. But if he's not wanting to, to, to go in that direction and then you're feeling frustrated, the chances are that won't be a, a productive conversation. So the rule of thumb, as I see it, would always be to try and have that conversation when the rapport is good. And then at least then you'll have the opportunity to be able to maybe be opened up to more creative solutions that you'll be able to access your wisdom in the moment. There'll little, be a little bit more clarity. And I guess, you know, in that sense, that's really, that's, that's the direction I would always encourage, certainly our clients to, to move in is just to try and, at those what seemingly feel like more difficult conversation when the rapport is good, when, when there is that much greater scope to, to access that wisdom and your, and your creativity. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's the way I see it. Thanks, Angus. I'd like to go next. There's a lot of questions here. 
you see one for you, Scott? I'll let you go next if you do. I can take, take a couple I see too. Um, I could take one from Melanie who has a question about how she can help her Nana um, who's feeling old um, and um, kind of caught up in the, in the uh, uh, she, she's going blind and is a bit unsteady in her physical state these days. She's so bright, but she's just so down about being old. You know, here's the thing. One of the great paradoxes of, of this understanding is um, to really help somebody, sometimes it's most helpful to see something deep for yourself first. And, and what I mean by that is that if, um, if you can also see that, you're, that your Nana's okay, it somehow provides a space for your Nana to have kind of her own, her own way of resetting and connecting with something that's deeper beyond her state of feeling old. Feeling old is, is a, an accumulation of all of the ideas and thoughts that we have about where we are in life and uh, what we've done in the past and where we're going in the future. And all of a sudden it creates this physical experience where we find evidence for it. And it can seem really overwhelming. But what's also true is behind all of that is a, a way in which vitality is still at work. And um, by, by being able to see that for ourselves, we can also help to see it in other people. And when we can see it in other people, it gives them permission to trust that they have it too. And so part of that, I, I think really kind of the meat of that question is really about um, being curious about how this is true for you already. Um, and then seeing what occurs to you uh, in conversation with your Nana and see what arises there. Cool. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to, um, I see like four or five that are really similar. So I'm going to see if I can, it's a big challenge, but I'm going to see if I can kind of address all of them in one. So I'll, I'm going to read Paul. So Paul says, if my habits and anxieties are just thoughts, my brain, the machine, my brain is the machine that does that thinking. I think I'm slowly getting that. Awesome. But then who is the I that's having the metacognition or with which brain am I thinking about my thinking? So that's very similar to uh, a few other questions here around the hardest thing for me to understand is if we're not our thoughts and we're something else, who are we? Um, someone had a question about distinguishing it's hard to distinguish between my thoughts and me and how do I do that? So um, it's a nice easy one. Um, I'll just say some things and see what lands with you. First of all, I, I think, you know, for me, what's been really helpful is in, is in looking, and I think for a lot of people, because people tend to talk a lot about thought, especially around this understanding, right? Again, it's, it's kind of like our habit. It's like the thing that we see, that we feel, like we see the effects of it, like we feel that we experience it. it it's, it's something we're very used to. So this, this constant narration that's happening in our heads all the time, and it's happening visually, and, and we can hear it, and we can feel it, and all of that. We just live in a sea of, of thinking and experience it's really helpful sometimes to just keep it really simple and say, wow, I'm feeling and experiencing all of life through this moment to moment thinking. It's the only way I can experience anything in life. And there's something beyond that. I don't know what it is. I mean, I, you know, even if like, I have a feel for it myself, what's beyond that? And I could put some words to it, but that would probably just muddy your feet. It wouldn't even do you much good. Like you kind of get your own feel for it. But what I think is super helpful is just seeing that there's something. And again, just ask that as a what if, if you don't even know that there's something. Like what if there's something beyond all this stuff that I see and feel and hear and smell in the world? What could it be? What's there when my thinking settles down? when I feel really relaxed and open and expansive and things are just easy and I feel like I'm present in the moment, what's that? And how is that different from this little chatterbox that's constantly telling me what I should do and how things are going? And, you know, so, so there's no answer really, you know, that, that I would feel comfortable giving, but to just kind of 
explore that for yourself. And we certainly don't have to distinguish it. I mean, there are the things like if you're not feeling well, if everything in your body is tight, if you're in your habit, if you're fighting with your spouse, you know, like you're in, you're in a bunch of thinking like that. You'll kind of see it by your feeling, but don't make it a, a job to kind of go out and distinguish who am I and what's my thinking and what's the difference. Cause I think that's just a big rabbit hole. I think we just want to get a feel for that. There's something there beyond all this and, and kind of explore that yourself. Yeah, I think, um, I know we've got a number of questions. We're coming towards the end of our time. We don't give everyone a chance to, you know, make any kind of closing comments, but so I'll just kick that off. But I, um, I think ultimately, I, I like what Amy, you know, just kind of to build on where Amy left it is that this understanding is not a recipe for improving yourself and um, getting your act together and resolving all of your issues. I mean, it does seem to help <laughs> in all that, right? There, but it, it really is, as long as I kept looking at it as a, a way to help me fix myself, I realized that I was in misunderstanding. Because one of the premises is, which we've talked about, is this idea of beyond all these ideas of who we think we are, we have this infinite well of being, this innate well-being. It doesn't mean that like we walk around feeling good all the time, but what does it mean? It means that we have this kind of intelligence, this design to the system that helps us find our way, that helps us stabilize, that gives us helpful thinking, it helps us rise to the occasion, you know, that there's something alive and available to us that we can only appreciate through our own personal self-exploration. It, it, we can't appreciate it fully through our conceptual mind. And so, you know, this idea of, I remember, like, I said, oh, okay, so you're saying I'm, I'm at my core, I'm well, like beyond all my physical and mental and, you know, history that I'm okay that that asset, you know, and so, well, then I, something rang through for me in that. I could feel that, like that resonated for me, but my mind had a lot of evidence why that wasn't true. And that's where I kept getting tripped up, but in a, in a helpful way, like that tripping up ended up being really good because I started to see like, if I believe ultimately I, I'm okay, then how can I also be on a quest to fix myself? Maybe the idea that I need fixing and the fact that I focus on my behavior and what needs improvement is, you know, being a, a false reality, right? That's being shaped by habitual thoughts and ideas of how I thought I worked. And so, you know, I think the opportunity for all of us is to get more curious about what we don't know about ourselves than what we've already determined. So um, anybody else, just final kind of comments. And then of course we want to let people know about July too. Angus and Rohini, you want to kick that off? Any yeah. final thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to say um, that that piece that you said, Barb, in terms of this is not about fixing yourself. It's, it seems very paradoxical. Then what's the point, right? I would have said previously, what's the point if this isn't about fixing me? But there's such freedom and liberation in recognizing that there's nothing to be fixed and having the, the room for your humanness and the ability to, to see that there's nothing wrong with who you are and that yes, we have preferences. Yes, we have things that we like and we don't like about ourselves and about others, but fundamentally we are okay. And that's the experience that allows life to be more graceful, allows relationships to be easier and so that's really the direction that we're pointing in. Yeah, I mean, it kind of feels counterintuitive because I think we spend a good portion of our marriage both trying to fix each other. And when that was taken off the table, it's amazing how everything, you know, came back into balance, came, found its equilibrium, found its natural core. And there's something so beautiful in that understanding. It, it, and it does feel counterintuitive, but really it's amazing to think that, you know, we let go of those standards and expectations and we'll, we'll find our natural buoyancy. Yeah, you know, I think I, I really love to, I love Barb, 
what you're pointing to as well, and because I think it, it is a really big misunderstanding. And, and unfortunately, I think um, in a really human way, we, we, cloud our, we cloud our experience with expectations about where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be up to and, and how we're supposed to feel. And, and I really feel like what this understanding does for, for humans is it's like it, it increases our travel and our shocks for life so that we can more easily travel bumpy roads and, and terrain that is uh, undulating and in the unknown in a more graceful way. And if that's all we ever get from it, well then hallelujah. <laughs> I'll just quickly add, there was a question we didn't quite get to about, um, about how it appears that we've had a shift. We've each had a shift and do people have to shift and how that works. And, you know, I, I think it, it, it ties into what we're all wrapping up with here, which is like seeing that we're always shifting. Like we, we are well, we are, we are made of health, we're made of vitality, oh, that is our nature. And we're designed to thrive, not just fix problems, not just like fall into holes and dig our way out. Like we're, our design is such that it wants us to thrive in all of these areas that we're talking about in every other area of life. And that was just so, took so much off me to learn when I first was coming across this. Like, oh, there's momentum in favor of everything kind of, you know, landing and working out. And it's beautiful to see more about that. All right, I think we're at time. So it's been a lot of fun. We're so grateful to all of you that showed up live and those of you that are listening after. We do want to let you know that we're having a workshop in July in Santa Monica, the 19th through the 21st, where we're going to have a lot more room and space and time to go deeper into each of these areas and talk more. You know, our hope is that it's going to be interactive and um, we're going to make it really relevant and meaningful to all of you. Anything you guys want to add about that? Uh, yeah, someone's asking if it's a live workshop. It is. It's in person in Santa Monica. And uh, since you signed up for the webinar, you will be getting information about it um, uh, afterwards, along with the recording of the webinar. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> it's going to be this, but like Barb said, deeper and with so much room and space and lots of interaction. And we can really dive into this. And yeah, we can't wait. Yeah, we'd love to see you guys there. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Well, thanks, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.